the topic of my uh, presentation is written here, I think, on cultural process at the Lithuanian Belarusian borderlands. Uh, in Lithuanian language, it uh, sounds at the culture process in Lithuania and Baltarusia. Uh, the structure of my presentation is following. First of all, I'd like to discuss some theoretical backgrounds of this topic, how the borderlands are defined. And uh, I shall use some terms and some concepts concerning uh, the notion of borderlands and uh, the phenomena of borderlands and the typicality of this problem. The second. Belarus and the paradoxes of its borderlands. I will try to discuss uh, the problem of Belarusian uh, borderlands in the category of paradoxes. I don't know whether it works, but we shall see. The third, uh, Belarusians, Poles and Russians in Grodno region, culture and identity. And the, second one, uh, the last one, or maybe it will be the third, uh, and I'll change uh, these uh, elements of the structure of this presentation. Lithuanian said the borderlands language, religion and identity. So first of all, some, uh, some words about uh, the problem of the borderlands, how the borderlands are defined. The problem of the borderlands is very topical uh, during the last 20-25 years, and the first reason is that the borderlands really exist. The second reason is that uh, all the wars started from the border borderlands. So this is uh, very interesting and uh, in many aspects it's a potentially very dangerous, dangerous area. Well, uh, uh, there are many works, uh, especially in American and British uh, literature concerning uh, the theoretical aspects, uh, the Irish literature of course, uh, concerning the borderlands. So, um, uh, the borderlands, uh, uh, semantically, the, the, the term the borderlands is derived from the, well, the border, and the border is a the line which uh, surrounds the state territory and defines the limits of its sovereignty. Uh, James Prescott is an Australian scholar. Or Donan and Wilson, uh, well-known uh, Irish scholars of the borderlands, the, place which, the places which mark the limits of state power. Uh, Sometimes it can be defined as usually visible line which separates the states and the border uh, is the space located close to the political, to the borderlands, to the political borders. Or in other words, it's called the frontier. Uh, Francis Turner, well-known American scholar of the beginning of the 12th century, used this, this term. So, uh, in another way, the borderlands are constituted by the borders, which influence upon uh, different aspects of life of its population. And Oscar Martinez, a well-known American scholar who studied uh, the area adjacent to the American-Mexico border, uh, used the expression, the border people. Well, uh, Ansaldua, also a well-known um, scholar, of the present day, uh, she works in uh, postmodern modernist tradition. Uh, wrote that uh, the borderland is the place where the life forces of two neighboring worlds connect uh, and constitute the third world in between the world of bordering culture. Can I uh -huh. press button F five? F five, but it doesn't work. Uh, no, 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 no. I try to do it, but and this one now. Um, one of this. This? No. Uh -huh. The third one. The third. Uh -huh. One, two, three. This one. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Oh. So, uh, the character of the borderlands depends on the character of the border, of the political border, and the border can be uh, expressed uh, metaphorically as the wall, which very strictly uh, separates the states. The border can be defined also metaphorically as the door, which connects the states, but uh, the possibility of this connection is rather limited. And the border uh, can be defined or uh, expressed uh, by the metaphor as the bridge. So uh, from this point of view, Oscar Martinez, who studied the American-Mexico border, um, proposed four types of the borderlands, alienated borders, uh, which are strictly separated they may be conflict, uh, not conflict, but nevertheless they're separated. Coexisting, interdependent, and integrated. So from uh, later we shall use these uh, terms to understand uh, the changing character of the Belarusian borders. 
besides the notion of border uh, in the American and British literature, uh, the term boundaries are used. Uh, this term is used to express uh, the lines which divide cultures and ethnic groups or ethnic groups and their cultures. So uh, there is no definite um, uh, or uh, there is no definition which uh, will which is uh, common to all the scholars of this problem. So we can uh, use uh, the definition like this: uh, boundaries is the invisible line which divides but which divide groups, groups, ethnic groups, but not only ethnic groups, social groups, and so on. We can speak about social boundaries, ethnic boundaries, uh, gender boundaries, and so on and so on. So this uh, this term is is uh, used very widely. Uh, uh, in the present day literature. So, uh, in this way, so the boundaries, uh, the borders and boundaries separate states, peoples, and cultures. They constitute the common space of their coexistence and cross cultural relations. They create the minorities and the problem of the minorities because uh, the political boundaries and borders and cultural boundaries uh, never uh, coincide or almost never co coincide. That's why. And uh, one more. Um, the area uh, of the borderlands, uh, this area develops the peculiar border practices. So uh, I uh, quote uh, the expression of Antonina Klaskowska, uh, well known Polish scholar of the problem of border and boundaries and, and border cultures. Uh, recently she, she has gone, she is one of the most prominent uh, Polish sociologists and the founder of uh, the Polish School of Sociology. So, the place where people learn, people learn how to live together, or the era of mutual training in coexistence. I, I think it's a good expression. So, if we take into account uh, the cultural boundaries uh, of the borderlands, uh, we speak about them as the constructs. That means that they, first of all, they exist in our conscience. First of all, we speak about us and them. And we, if we say we and them, that's why we make an uh, intellectual or mental boundary. And we construct this boundary on a different uh, basis, uh, I mean cultural basis. For example, on uh, the origin, on language, on religion religion, on tradition, uh, and on uh, symbols, and so on and so on. I'll make one example about how uh, different kinds of symbols are used to express the boundary, or not, or not to express, to hide the boundary. Several years ago I've been to Egypt, well, and I'm very interested in the way of life of Coptic population of Egypt, and I found it, a person. I thought he was a Coptic. Well, and I, uh, he gave me his hand, I showed his hand, and I turned his hand in this way, and I saw uh, the tattoo of the cross. Oh, you're Coptic, I told. Yes, yes, and you are Christian as well. So we, uh, I belong to one culture, he belongs to another culture, and we understand that we belong to one culture, to, to Christian culture, not, we're not Muslims. Well, uh, so of course everyone knows that the situation with the Coptic population is rather um, complicated in Egypt, that's why they have such signs, but they have to hide, hide them. Another, an, another example, several years ago I've been to Poland to a youth camp and there were British people, Englishmen and uh, the Welsh people. So you know that Welsh people preserve their language, but how do they um, def um, define themselves? And how they, what what symbols do they use not to mix themselves with the with the, with the Englishmen? Well, uh, first of all, they have also tattoos, uh, different kinds of tattoos, and the, these tattoos, Welsh tattoos, are well known, and uh, literature is dedicated, uh, enormous literature dedicated to the character of these tattoos. I asked about these tattoos, so a young man told me that I use this tattoo just to express my identity, my Welsh identity. Okay, so. This is the Republic of Belarus, the map of the Republic of Belarus, and we see that it borders several, several countries. So it's political border, uh, it has political border with Poland, with Lithuania, with Latvia, with Russia, more than 1,000 kilometers, and with Ukraine. So, if we use uh, the uh, ideas of Oscar Martinez concerning the types of the borderland, so we can say that um, the border uh, with Poland and with Lithuania and Latvia can be expressed in, in the terms of the border, the door. So we have to, to 
get visas, to go to Poland or to Lithuania. It doesn't mean that it's prohibited, it's not prohibited, so it's, it's, it's free, theoretically it's free, practically it's rather, rather difficult. So if we take into account the rest of the borders with Russia and with Ukraine, so of course, of course the, the border is open, it's the border, 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 border is a breach. Well, if we compare uh, the present-day situation with uh, uh, Soviet times, of course, the border with Poland was completely closed, though Soviet Union and Poland belong to so-called socialist camp, but it was rather difficult, almost impossible, uh, to get to, to, to Poland at those times. So if we take into account the border of Belarus with Latvia, Lithuania, uh, and the rest of so-called uh, socialist republics of Soviet Union, so it was open. It was, it was, it was open. So the, uh, the character of the border changes over, over the time. Well, and nowadays, of course, uh, and the situation with the border with Russia is uh, discussed and the Ukraine is discussed uh, because uh, from one hand it's very easy to go to Russia, but uh, on another hand, so many people come from Russia to Belarus and criminal people and other um, people not expected, of course, here in Belarus. That's why this border is, is open, but nevertheless, it's a, from this point of view, it might be considered as a dangerous. So what concerns the borders with Poland and, and Lithuania? So as far as I know, during the last three years, uh, it's uh, the topic of uh, the border area of 30 kilometers or 50 kilometers from the border uh, to Belarus and to Poland uh, is discussed as uh, the possibility of going, of crossing the border, of easy crossing the border, but it seems to me that uh, it's not in the progress. Well, so Belarus consists of uh, six regions. Now you see the map of Grodno region. Grodno region was uh, organized or uh, proclaimed in September 1944. It's one of the, it's, it's the smallest region from the point of view of uh, its uh, population. It's about one over one million and uh, from the point of its um, number of square kilometers, only 25 square kilometers. So, uh, and uh, Grodno region is interesting from the point of view of uh, its bordering, uh, as a bordering territory, you know, because uh, 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 this is the border of Grodno region with Poland and this is the border with Lithuania. That's why it's uh, uh, the political bordering area, the territorial bordering area. But it's, it's the bordering area from uh, some uh, diff uh, different points of view and I try to point out these aspects of the bordering area of Grodno. So first, it's political, it's frontier. Second, it's ethnic and national borderlands because uh, a little bit later we shall see uh, the ethnic structure of, of border region. Uh, different ethnic groups live here and we uh, say that it's the ethnic borderlands and cultural borderlands. It's a linguistic borderlands because different languages are used here in this area. It's confessional borderlands. We, we shall speak a little bit about the religions. And it's so-called uh, civilization borderlands. The border between invisible, uh, but everyone knows in our country. Uh, to go to Europe, it means to cross uh, the political border with Poland. I've been to Europe, or we shall go to Europe, so where Europe stops, uh, Sigmund Baumann uh, discusses this, this question, what is Europe and what are the borders of Europe, if we take into account not geographical, but for example mental, political, or, or even civilization aspects. So West and West meet somewhere in, in Grodno region. Now, there are some figures. We have had two census in Belarus, national census. The first one in 1991, the second 10 years later in 2009. So there are the, the first and the, uh, the third column uh, give the columns give the uh, absolute uh, numbers of the representatives of national and ethnic groups and the second and the fourth columns uh, represent the uh, percentage of these groups and the last column uh, reveals the dynamics of the population. So the Belarusians constitute 62 percent of Grodno region. Nowadays uh, the Belarusians constitute 66, almost 67 percent. Nevertheless the number of Belar Belarusians is decreasing. The Poles the absolute number and the percentage of the Poles is decreasing as well. So almost um, 63,000 uh, uh, persons and uh, 10 years ago every fourth person of Grodna region was of Polish origin, now, nowadays only 21%. Uh, the same with Russians. 
the, the Russian population was increasing uh, during the after war decades and in 1991 more than 1,100 uh, 100, of Russians constituted uh, the uh, Russian uh, community in Grodna region. So more than 10%. Nowadays only 87.5. It means that 8%. Uh, the number of uh, absolute number of the uh, Russians uh, they, they didn't go out from, from Belarus. Of course, someone uh, lived in Belarus, some, some Russians came to Belarus. But uh, the main question is the question of the changing of identity. It concerns the Belarusians, the Poles and the Russians and the Ukrainians as well. So, of course, uh, uh, very interesting figures uh, concerning the Lithuanians, but I shall speak uh, deeper about the uh, Lith Lithuanian community. So nowadays uh, only 2,000 uh, Lithuanian people live in Grodno region. Well, and it's just a symbolic, a symbolic number, but nevertheless, so it's a traditional population of Lithuanian uh, borderlands. The same about the Tatars. They are also decreasing, so not so rapidly as the rest of uh, our ethnic groups. The Jews, so it's our history, not present day, because only 500 of Jews, uh, according to the, census, uh, the last census, live in Belarus. So, but but um, the head of the Jewish community told me that uh, in reality there are more to, uh, than 2,000 Jews live in, in Grodno region, in, in Grodno uh, especially. Well, but not all of them declare themselves or identify themselves as the Jews. So general uh, picture is, shows uh, the decreasing of the total population of Grodno region and uh, the decreasing of all the ethnic, the number of all the ethnic groups here, including the Belarusians. The first, though the, the percentage of Belarusians is, 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 is growing up. Now we shall see what's, what was happening during uh, the last, uh, uh, after the war decades. Uh, you see one, two, three, four, five columns. Uh, these columns illustrate uh, uh, the results of the censuses the Soviet Union census, the last Soviet census uh, took place in 1980-89. So you see that the number of Belarusians was growing, now it's decreasing. The number of Poles is hesitating. It's a very interesting phenomenon which uh, hasn't been noticed by the scholars and it, it wasn't described or uh, interpreted somehow. You see, in 1959 there were three, over 300,000 Poles. After that, 10 years later, only 276. So the pearls disappeared. 60,000 of pearls disappeared in Grodno region. What has happened? So it was um, uh, the period of the forced Belarusization of the pearls. Uh, it was uh, done in different ways. And I personally spoke with different kinds of people who told me that uh, it was a period when, when the, uh, the nationality was written in the passports. So if you won't write that you are the Pearl, so you'll have some privileges. And if you insist that you are of Polish uh, origin, so you will have troubles. So people didn't want to have troubles. That's why they were eager to uh, identify themselves as the Belarusians. But there was a reason for that, because the process of uh, depolonization uh, lasted for several decades after the war. The Polish schools were closed, the Polish newspapers were prohibited. So, uh, and uh, the example was the Polish village Nacha, uh, where we made a case study um, several, several times. So in this village, the people of older generation told that we are bilingual, we can speak Polish and Paprosto, or Belarusian, simple Belarusian, Belarusian language. So well, we meet together, we speak Polish, but we were afraid to speak Polish, for example, in public uh, places. We spoke Paprosto, we spoke simple Belarusian, Belarusian, Belarusian language. And the second, the third generation didn't speak Polish at all. Uh, the grandmother is speaking Polish and the great granddaughter is speaking only Russian. So they belong to one and the same ethnic group or the same nation, but they speak different languages. That's why it was easier uh, in this context of cultural assimilation to, uh, to make um, the passport assimilation. That's why the number of Poles De uh, decreased. And after that, 10 years later, uh, we found that 
almost 30,000 of pearls appeared in Grodno region. From where? They didn't come from Poland, they didn't come from any other country. Well, also it's an interesting phenomenon. Well, uh, it, wa it was a sign of uh, growing up of the hidden uh, identity, Polish identity. By the passport, I'm Belarusian, but I feel myself as a Pearl. Well, and by that time, it was another time, it was not 59, it was uh, nine, 1979. By that time, so people were not afraid uh, to uh, identify themselves as the Pearls. Well, then uh, uh, the, the stability, and after that, the decline. Nowadays, no one uh, asks or insists uh, upon the Pearls. To, 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 to identify them as the Belarusians. No, uh, the problem is that the changing of the identity depends on, uh, on the situation with the cultural process, process with the Polish population. I'll speak about these process a little bit later. Well, the Lithuanians, you know, it, uh, it decreased almost uh, twice. In 1970, there were more than 4,000. Lithuanians in Grodno region. Nowadays, over 2,000. The same about the Tatar population and the Jewish population. So, uh, this uh, picture uh, gives, uh, so shows the uh, structure of uh, ethnic structure of the town of Grodno. Uh, it's the most multi ethnic and multicultural town in the Republic of Belarus. So. To, to some extent, uh, the figures which you see in the one, two, three, in the fourth column, in the uh, column, so uh, these, uh, these figures coincide with the figures of uh, uh, the general general structure of, of, of Grodno, Grodno region. So we have a majority and we have minorities. The problem of minorities is, is very topical to, to Grodno region. So we, um, the problem of classification of minorities is a theoretical problem. It's possible to, to, to make different approaches to uh, this classification. So maybe my Lithuanians, uh, Lithuanian audience know uh, well, I acquainted with Natalia Kasatkina. Uh, who, she was born here in Kaunas and she uh, studied at uh, the Ka uh, Kaunas uh, uh, Polytechnical University. Uh, later she worked in Vilnius, uh, the in Institute of Sociology uh, in, in Vilnius and she was a very prominent, prominent sociologist, not only practically but she was theoretically thinking. Uh, and she proposed a very interesting classification of the minorities of Lithuania. Well, I propose uh, the next classification. There are territorial groups, the Poles and Lithuanians, borderlands minorities, the Poles and Lithuanians as well, the diasporas, uh, the Jewish diaspora, the Russian diaspora, the Ukrainian diaspora, the historical minorities which live uh, in, in Belarus for, for centuries, the Tatars, the Russian old believers and the Jews, uh, after war labor migrants, the Russians and the Ukrainians and probably the others, and the new migrants, uh, the others, the Georgians, the Armenians, well, and so on. It's necessary to take into account uh, the difference between the different uh, groups of minorities uh, because it's very topical and uh, practically how many Polish schools we need, for example. 20 years ago there were no Polish schools. Nowadays there are two Polish schools. Is it enough or not enough? Well, how to um, make the politics uh, of uh, cultural politics towards Polish minority, towards Lithuanian minority, or towards, uh, for example, Ukrainian minority or to new minorities. Well, the new minorities in, in, in Grodno region, the Azerbaijans, about one. 1,000, uh, the Uzbeks, uh, 150 Arabs appeared in Grodno, in Grodno region. Where they live and what are they are doing, I can't answer this question, but nevertheless, uh, the census show. The Armenians, the Chinese, the Vietnamese, the Greek minority, and so on, and so on, and so on. <laughs> Sorry, it, it's not as self-advertising. So, <laughs> uh, it's a revival of the forgotten groups. There is a Dutch minority in Grodno. Uh, some two and a half uh, centuries ago there was a Dutch quarter in Grodno. Only one house has remained from those times. The Dutch people who were invited by Antoni Tisan House, by the last king uh, of Rech Pospolita, Stanislav Ogus Poniatowski, uh, they settled in Grodno. There were several hundreds of Dutch people. So uh, nowadays there are only a few Dutch people, but they try to trace uh, their history and to find uh, the documents concerning the history of Dutch uh, immigration and uh, da Dutch, Dutch groups. So I met some, some, some of them in Grodno several years ago. 
So uh, we speak about uh, the Grodno region as, as uh, the borderlands in, 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 in different uh, terms. So it's, it's uh, multicultural. It's uh, the, the area which uh, demonstrates the cultural diversity. So different languages are spoken here. First of all, it's Belarusian language, literate dialect Belarusian language and mixed Belarusian language or uh, so-called Rosanka as, as we call it. According to some uh, social linguists, so 70 per percent of the population of Grodno region speak Rosanka. It's not a written language, it's not a literate language, but nevertheless all people speak. It's a mixture between uh, Russian and Belarusian, sometimes with Pol Polish language. Though Belarusian language is an official language, the first official language according to the constitution, uh, according to the sociological uh, research and investigation, so from three to five percent of the Belarusian people speak uh, literate Belarusian language in Grodno, in Grodno region, probably in Belarus as well. The second, Russian literate language. So everyone knows that uh, if we cross the Belarusian border, we, the first language we hear is the Russian language. We come to Belarus, but we hear the Russian language. Uh, I shall <laughs> tell you a, a short story, like an anecdote. Uh, we have um, some uh, resorts, not bad, and many people from Russia come to Grodno region just to have, to have a rest. And one of them is called Radon. And a lady from Siberia bought uh, the opportunity to come to Radon and uh, she knew that Radon was located somewhere in Belarus. That's why she bought a book, a handbook of Belarusian language because she wanted to speak some words of the language of the people uh, she would meet well and you can imagine her, how she was uh, disappeared when she didn't meet uh, the people speaking Belarusian language so she threw away all the books and all the handbooks well I, I, I spoke to to this lady and she said where can we find Belarusian culture Belarusian language and Belarusian culture in Belarus it's, it's a topical question. The Polish language. So no one speaks Polish. If, if we, uh, every uh, fifth person of Grodno region are of Polish origin. But we can sp hear the Polish language only in the churches, uh, only among the old people when they gather to speak about their problems, and uh, as the folklore language. So uh, the Polish people sing their songs, of course, in Polish language. The Ukrainian, the German language was uh, used very widely in in Belarus because uh, no, I'm sorry in Grodno region because uh, many Germans were invited also by Antoni Tisenhaus uh, in the uh, middle of the 18th century to to to, to Grodno to develop uh, the economics uh, the culture and so on and so on for for, for different purposes so uh, they they came and they spoke German language for centuries uh, every uh, tenth person of Grodno, according to the first sentence of uh, census of Russian Empire, uh, spoke German, and the Germans considered Grodno to be a, a German town. And when the occupation started in 1941, Grodno was launched to to Prussia, not to Belarus, but to Prussia. To Prussia. Nowadays, German language is spoken, but the German population is rather symbolic, 150 and 50 uh, per, uh, percent. So they are all assimilated. But when they visit uh, the services, uh, the German church, so they try to sing uh, the Luther chorals in German. Now, there are some other spheres where the German language is used. The Jewish Hebrew and, of course, the Ukrainian language is also used. Well, uh, the mm, census um, presents uh, the, uh, the figures uh, of the mother tongue of ethnic groups. Well, the majority of the Belarusians consider the Belarusian language as uh, their mother tongue, though they don't use it in practice. Uh, uh, 65 Poles consider the Belarusian language as their mother tongue, not the Polish language. Only 18%, about 20% of the Poles consider the Polish language as their mother tongue. Uh, very interesting phenomena concerning the Russians. Almost 12% of the Russians consider Belarusian language as their mother tongue, and only 88% uh, of the Russians uh, consider the Russian language as their mother tongue. The same with the Ukrainians. So. Uh, what about the mother tongue of the Jews? It's a difficult question. Uh, the, the, the national language of the Jews. Of course, old people of Jewish origin, they speak the Hebrew language and the Yiddish, the Jewish language, Yiddish, Yiddish language. But our senses don't make difference between these two mother tongue languages of the Jewish population. Well, what concerns the Lithuanians? You see, 60% of the Lithuanians consider the Lithuanian language to be their mother tongue. 
and it's the highest percent among all the groups uh, of, of the minorities. Only 25% of the Lithuanians consider the Belarusian language as the mother tongue, and 13% uh, declared that uh, their mother tongue is Russian language. Uh, not everything clear with the Tatars, because uh, so-called Belarusian, you call them Lithuanian Tatars. The Poles uh, identify them as the Polish Tatars. They are the ancestors of the Tatars, which appeared here 600 years ago from Crimea, from other parts uh, of uh, the Tatar world. Well, but <laughs> only men appeared, and they married uh, local women. And of course, in the third or the second generation, uh, they spoke the local language. They spoke Belarusian language. Uh, and even nowadays, for example, in Ivia, uh, the place where more than 1,000 Tatars uh, are located. So I've been there several times, uh, and I heard, so, Zaraz my poezie, my pohavorim nashoyu mowayu, the Tatars say, say, say. So, so they consider the Belarusian language as their national, as, as, their, as their mother tongue, not Tatar language. Uh, because our senses no, don't make... Uh, uh, difference between uh, the local Tatars and the Tatars from Kazan, who came here from, 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 for example, from Russia. They are completely different groups of Tatars. So in Grodno, 52% uh, of the total population uh, consider uh, the Belarusian language uh, as, as uh, their mother tongue, and 42% consider um, Russian language is the mother, the mother tongue. Well, but also our census don't make difference between uh, the literal Belarusian language and and Rosyanka, the mixed Belarusian language. So if we take into account, for example, the literal Belarusian language, I repeat these figures from two to five percent, not more. So they use uh, in this area. Well, uh, and uh, this um, tablet gives. The figure of languages used at home in, in Grodno region. Belarusian language, the, the, uh, the, the Russian language, and the language of nationality. So you see that Russian language dominates among all the ethnic, ethnic groups, uh, especially uh, dominates in the, Belarusian, in the Belarusian community. Well, that's why we shall return to these pictures a little bit. So the situation uh, of the borderlands, and especially of Grodno region as a bordering area, may be expressed uh, in the terms of the paradoxes. Paradox, the first paradox, homogeneity and ethnic and cultural diversity. So I try to show that we have different uh, languages, different peoples, different religions, so now we shall spe speak about religions and so on and so on. From one point of view, from the, another point of view, so. Uh, uh, we cannot uh, guess who is who in, in, in Grodno. For example, I worked uh, for three months at the uh, Educological University in Vilnius. So it's possible to guess. These are the Lithuanians, these are the Belarusians, they speak Belarusian language, there. these are the Russians, these are the Poles. Okay, so probably it's possible to guess, to guess in this uh, audience as well. But if uh, I, I speak, for example, to an audience at home, well, it's, it's impossible to guess who is who, but I, I know approximately that uh, 60, 50, 60 or 70 percent are the Belarusians, there are Poles, there are Russians, and so on and so on and so on, but everyone speaks Russian, I teach in Russian language and so on. Well, so the identity is hidden, it's not expressed. So that's why the first paradox I think is topical. The second paradox, assimilated majority, assimilated minorities. So usually the majority tries to assimilate minorities. Or uh, if the situation is expressed in the terms of cultural pluralism, for example, so the uh, majority gives uh, the, uh, the opportunity for the minorities to preserve their culture, their languages, their religions, and so on and so on. Well, but in, 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 in Grodno region and in Belarus as well, the majority is assimilated. The majority, I mean the Belarusians, are Russified. And the Russified Belarusian majority Russifies the minorities. This is the paradox of our country and our, our uh, bordering areas. The third paradox. Ethnic is determined, cultural uh, identity is determined, cultural identity is not determined. Uh, for 20 years we um, have no mm, marks in the past concerning our, our belonging, national belonging, national identity. But it doesn't mean that people lose the identity. No, if we ask into the census and during the case studies, sociological case studies, we ask, so we, they say we are the Belarusians, we are the Poles, and so on and so on. Well, but why? And uh, this is the paradox. Uh, so the identity is constructed on different cultural biases. One says, 
that I am Belarusian because I was born to Belarusian parents. Uh, the second says, I am Belarusian because I speak Belarusian. The third says, I am Belarusian because I was born in Belarus. The fourth says, I am Belarusian because everyone considers me that I am Belarusian. Well, and so on. Well, the same about the Poles. Well, so uh, the identity, and it's, it's very typical, it's, it's a bordering identity which is constructed in, on the basis of different culture, on different cultural biases. That's why it's moving, it's changing, it's uh, occasional sometimes, it depends on the different process, social process, uh, the prestige of, uh, of uh, uh, ethnic group and so on. That's why we lost 60,000 uh, of Poles some 30 years ago, then we found 30,000 of Poles, now we are losing the Poles and the number of Belarusian is growing and the percentage of the Belarusian is growing, that's a paradox. The fourth paradox, the growing prestige of Belarusian identity and the, the decline of value of Belarusian national culture. I think that uh, the previous tablets so uh, reveal this, this paradox. Uh, it's, 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 it's very prestigious to, 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 to belong to Belarusian nation because uh, the Belarusians have the state, uh, independent state and so on from one point of view and from another point of view. So uh, the prestige of language is declining. So. Uh, it's, it's very obvious. And the fifth paradox, the stability of identity and identities, plural, transitional and not strictly determined. Now I shall show you to change uh, the impression, some, some, some pictures uh, which uh, uh, show another aspect of multiculturalism or cultural pluralism or cultural diversity of Grodna area. So it's concerning the religions. So it's the religious borderland. So we have, according to the constitution and to the laws, we have so-called traditional religions and not traditional. So all the religions are free, of course, but traditional religions are supported uh, to a much extent by, by the government. So orthodoxy, of course, because uh, the majority of the Belarusian belong to um, Belarusian Orthodox Church, though 25% are the Catholics of the Belarusians, I mean. Catholicism, the majority of the Poles, so the Lithuanians, and uh, some percentage of the Belarusians, well, they are Catholics. Islam. Islam is considered to be a traditional religion uh, of Belarus because uh, the Belarusian Tatars, so they uh, try to preserve this religion and uh, there are several mosques open in, in different towns of Grodna area. Lutheranism, the German religion, and Judaism. Before the war, there were more than 40 synagogues in Grodno, more than the number of, for example, uh, uh, Orthodox churches and uh, Catholic churches and so on, and not traditional religion. So it's uh, of course, uh, I mentioned here not all of them, but only some of them. Baptism, the Pentecostal, the Adventism, uh, we have Jagos, Witness, Baha'i, the Mormons appeared at last several years ago when I've been to the States, so I, I communicated with the Mormons and they wanted me to bring Mormon religion to my country, but then I, <laughs> I, <laughs> of course I refused to do it. The old believers, it's a very small and very interesting group of Russian population, Greek Catholicism, Ju oh, I'm sorry, Judaism, it's a mistake, uh -huh. and some other religions. Well, this is the Orthodox Church in Grodno, one of the modern churches which was built about 100 um, years ago. This is the Lutheran Church, which was uh, constructed uh, at the end of the 18th century, and its functions and the services take place every, every Sunday. So the Germans speak Russian language, uh, which visit this ch church, but uh, they try to sing, and there is a school uh, of the German language, so they try to um, somehow to actualize the German language. Well, it's a well-known uh, Catholic cathedral in Grodno, it's one of the best and most interesting Catholic churches in, in, in Belarus. It's St. Boris and Glebo, a church in Grodno, which uh, we can find in every, every handbook, um, school handbook, so it's also in Grodno. It's a masterpiece of the 12th century. It's the Jewish synagogue in Grodno of the 16th century. Uh, one anecdote concerning the synagogue and the Jewish community. Have you heard the name of Mayor Lansky, who was the founder of so-called uh, Russian Mafia in the United States of America. So at the end of the uh, 19th century, this synagogue was uh, destroyed by the fire. And they needed, the Jewish community needed money to restore it, this synagogue. So this money was given by Suhavlansky, 
one of the richest uh, members of the Jewish Jewish community. After uh, the reconstruction of the synagogue, Mayor Suhavlansky decided to go to the States. Well, with his family, and he had a young son, Mayor. When they came to Ellis Island, uh, there was a um, um, office uh, for the immigrants, so uh, the, the, where they spoke about their names and, uh, and so on and so on. So all, all the procedures took place. So his name was cut, and he became Lansky. Mayor Lansky. A little bit later, Mayor Lansky created so-called Eastern Syndicate, and they are, how would you say it in, 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 in English? Sarval Suhoi Zakon. I, I, I forgot this expression. So on Sarval Suhoi Zakon. Well, after that, uh, he created Las Vegas and uh, all connected with the, this criminal games. Mayor Lansky died in 18, uh, 1983 and he was never captured by the police and he died himself so he, he was not he was not killed. Uh, so when I as a Fulbright grantee I've been to the state so I've been to Ellis Island and someone uh, just an unknown person asked me uh, where I was from and I decided to joke I told that I, I, I was uh, from the town where Mayor Lansky was born he didn't want to talk to me any longer. Well you are all the same <laughs> he told me. No, <laughs> such kind of people disappeared many decades ago. But uh, his, the synagogue, so which we have in Grudno, so in many aspects, is connected with with the creator uh, or with the stepfather of um, Jewish Jewish mafia in the United States of America. Well, now I shall speak about the Jew, uh, the Lithuanian community, and if we, if we have time, I will speak in details about the, the, the Poles and, and the rest, uh, the Russians, and so on. So, the Lithuanians and Lithuanian identity of the borderlands. Ah, it's a good picture. Uh, uh, it was a festival of national cultures. Every two years in Grodno um, come the members of different ethnic groups and uh, institutions, in, uh, national and cultural institutions who live, live in Belarus. So, and during three days we have a very good festival. So, in old uh, castle, you see in Belarusian language, is uh, written Litovsky Podvore, the Lithuanian yard. So the Lithuanians sing their songs there and uh, show different things which uh, they are traditionally make and they speak their language. So they tra traditionally the entire territory of the old castle of Grodno belongs during these three days to the Lithuanians. Well, uh, so there are no many Lithuanians in Grodno region, so more than 2,000 people, 2,000 point, point one. So it's just a symbolic figure. But uh, the distribution of this uh, group is, uh, is very specific. So some of them live uh, very close to the Lithuanian border, about 60%, and the rest live everywhere in Grodno region. So 300 Lithuanians live in Grodno, 200 Lithuanians live in Lida, so and they live in different in other towns and, and cities. So again, we see the map of Grodno region. Now we shall try to show you uh, the area where the Lithuanians live traditionally. So you see the Voronova district, and not far from Voronova, very close to the Lithuanian border, there is a village Nacha. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Pelesa, Pelesa. Probably you heard about this, this village. It's the main Lithuanian village in Grodno, Grodno region. The majority of the population of, it, of this village are the Lithuanians. The language is spoken in this village is the Lithuanian language. The school is Lithuanian. The church, Catholic church, is Lithuanian church. So it's so-called the capital of Lithuanian culture in, in Belarus. And please pay attention to another area, Ostrovets is the district of, of Ostrovets. So some 400 years ago, there were more than 500, uh, uh, I'm sorry, more than 50 uh, Lithuanian villages. Nowadays, there, uh, there are only 12 or 13 Lithuanian villages. So it's uh, the historical area, including Voronova, Ostrovets, to some extent Ashmiany, Lida, Grodno, well, even, even Shchuchin. Uh, so the area of the presence of the Lithuanian and Lithuanian culture, of course. Uh, in uh, Lithuanian literature, so I found such an expression, Lietuvio uh, etninio žemės. Uh, where is the border of this Lietuvio etninio žemės? It's difficult to say because uh, some people, some, some scholars find the um, to Lithuanian toponymics, well, I have no the whole map of Belarus because in Palesia, so in the southern part of Belarus, 
well, the linguists find the Lithuanian top top toponymics. What concerns this area? So, 50% uh, approximately of the toponymics is Lithuanian. For example, Lida, Lidity in Lithuanian to 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 my company Lidity or uh, Skidel. Not far from Grodno, there is a small small town of Skidel. Well, what, what is the, uh, for, for the origin or semantics of this word? Well, Skidis, Skidalis. Sheesh, a shield, yes? Well, well, no one knows about that, only the specialists maybe. Well, but nevertheless, so the, the toponymics is very, is very uh, spread. The anthroponymics, many Belarusians have Lithuanian uh, uh, last names, or the root, or the, the um, or derived from the last names are derived from uh, Lithuanian words. So Lithuanian culture is is is, is present uh, in the toponymics, in anthroponymics, in history, and in the present day life. But but so the border, the ethnic border, and according to Gibut Gibutenia, you, you all of you, of you know this prominent archaeologist, British archaeologist of Lithuanian origins, she, she uh, argued that uh, the majority of the territory of present-day Grodno uh, region and the Western Belarus was uh, settled by the Bolts, by the Lithuanians, or, or the ancestors of, of the Lithuanians. So, but uh, uh, during over centuries there was a process of so-called routinization, or routinization. So it's, uh, it was a process of the assimilation of the Bolts by uh, the Slavic pop pop population, and the result of this assimilation was that the border, ethnic border between uh, the Slavonic uh, groups and the Lithuanians moved to the north. And nowadays it's very diff diff difficult to, 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 to mark this border. It's somewhere here, somewhere here, but, but in this part of Lithuania also it's, it's not er er everything clear. In Shalchinian Kai, who live there? The Poles or the assimilated Lithuanians? Or the genuine Poles or not genuine Poles? So it's a question under, under, under the discussion all this so-called Vilnius, Vilnius, Vilnius region. Well, so there is somewhere here, but uh, there are some enclaves, about uh, 20, 20 villages uh, in this bordering area inhabited by the Lithuanians. But, and besides that, the Lithuanians live in, in Grodna, Lita and, and in other places. So this is the map of Voronova district. Well, <laughs> it's not very clear to, but here is Pelesa. Well, it's a small village with a population about several, uh, s s more than 100 persons, 150 persons, but it's a typical Lithuanian village. Well, well village of Pelesa, Lithuanian secondary school. You see, uh, this is uh, all this territory belongs to the school. There is a library. The, uh, the, uh, there is a, uh, an office of the Lithuanian community of Pelesa and, and the school. Uh, all uh, the process of training is in Lithuanian language. Ostrovets district. Well, but uh, Lithuanian culture uh, is uh, expressed also symbolically. For example, it's one. It's an interesting phenomenon. I, I learned about that uh, very recently. Jablonskis, one of the founders of the Lithuanian language, lived in Grodno for several years at the beginning of the 20th century, and he worked as a teacher of uh, the Latin language in Grodno male gymnasium. Here it is, it exists now, and uh, half a year ago we had a conference organized by, uh, we, I mean Grodno State University and the Institute of Lithuanian Language in Vilnius, so we organized a conference dedicated to the years, uh, Grodno years of uh, Jablonski, Jablonskis. Um, it's very interesting, of course. Well, uh, the cult Lithuanian culture is expressed symbolically in another way. So two years ago the main monument to Vitautas Magnus uh, was uh, appeared. Uh, and you see the um, members of the Lithuanian community, and to, to the left there is a monument, wooden monument to Vitautas Magnus. It's a phenomenon. So we, in Grodno we have two monuments to Vito, to Vitautas Magnus in Grodno, and the second one, second one in Pelisa. Well, of course, uh, the, um, we think about the identity in. It's possible, better to say, to think about identity in different ways, in the primordial way. So I'm Lithuanian because I have Lithuanian roots, but I have no Lithuanian roots. Well, though I, I, I don't think, feel myself uh, as a foreigner here in Lithuania. <laughs> well. But if we um, um, speak about the identity and think about the identity in a postmodern way, of course, we have to take into account the interrelations between we and they, between us and, 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 and them. So, first, we take into account that the Lithuanians is a local national group in Grodno region and very specific. Lithuanians are the minority 
in Grodno region. Uh, Lithuanians, uh, the peripheral group of Lithuanian nation, who has a country, who has its state, so about 10 or 20 kilometers from each Lithuanian village, and we can reach, reach the Lithuanian border. Well, that's, it's, it's, it's very important. And the background of the Lithuanian idea is based, first of all, on Lithuanian language. It's a tradition. In Lithuania, I uh, studied the problem how Lithuanian language uh, was revealed in the second half of the 19th century, uh, and how it became literate, and how it became the language of, of the nation, assimilated nation, as well as uh, the Belarusians. The second, Lithuanian traditional culture, I mean, not only dress, not only Lithuanian food, but uh, many is written about, about it in uh, anthropological literature. But I mean Lithuanian, uh, for example, uh, mythology. Norbertas Velius, I suppose that my Lithuanian colleagues know this name, one of the most prominent specialists in mythology, in, in uh, um, the author of the three volumes of Lithuanian mythology. Oh, he studied Lithuanian mythology in Belarus as well, in Voronovo region, in Ostrovets region, and so on, and he found that uh, there were very specific uh, elements of mythological construction of the world and mythological thinking. The third one, Catholicism, and the second and the last, uh, the specific values of Lithuanian Let's see. Uh, Lithuanians and the mother tongue. Elena Krokovskenia, uh, she is a sociologist from the Institute of Sociology in Vilnius. She presents uh, another figures which differ from uh, the figures presented by the census of the population. Mother tongues for the Lithuanians in uh, Grodno region totally. So 65 of the Lithuanians consider the Lithuanian language as their mother tongue. It's the highest uh, figure, much higher than the figure concerning the attitude of the Belarusians towards Belarusian language. 5% of the Lithuanians consider uh, Russian as their mother tongue. And it's possible to, to understand because uh, if the Lithuanians uh, immigrate to the towns, to Grodno, to Lida, to other towns, for example, and they are into ethnic marriages, of course, people start speaking Russian language. So it's uh, the most common way of uh, linguistic assimilation. Only 1% consider that the Polish language is the mother tongue for the Lithuanians. 18% are uh, declared uh, Belarusian as their mother tongue. Simple language, or just village Belarusian language, 2%, and about 9% other and not determined. So Elena Krokovskiani states that 82 or 87 percent of the Lithuanian families use the Lithuanian language in everyday communication. It's I underli underline this thesis that it's the highest percentage uh, among the, all the minorities and all the ethnic groups in Grodno region. So the main uh, background for the uh, identity is the Lithuanian language. Well, according to Belarusian scholars, 70% uh, of the Lithuanians use the native language at home, 40% communicate with friends, and in public sphere uh, the Lithuanian language is used by 5 or 10%. 10, 10 what I mean public sphere? So for several years ago I visited Grodno Theatre, so I, I, I visited rather regularly, but there was a play uh, on the Lithuanian background, I don't remember. And there was a group and they spoke Lithuanian language in the theater. It was interesting. Well, and for example, there is a church, Catholic church in Grodno. Every Sunday the service is in Lithuanian language. It's also the usage of this language in public, in public sphere. Uh, the source, Tevinainai, Baltarusiasi ir karaliavičias reities, Lietuvių patitis sociologinė apžvalda. Krokovskienė made a comparative study of uh, uh, the Lithuanians in Belarus, in Grodno region, and in uh, Kaliningrad uh, oblast, or Karaliavičius oblast. So the book was uh, published in 1996, but uh, the figures are topical, it seems to me. And she states that uh, in this area, I mean the Grodno region, Lithuanian language is fading out. But I think it's too, too early to, uh, to agree with this, with this statement. Well, 80% um, of the Lithuanians consider that they believe in God, Moreover, they uh, consider the Catholic religion to be their national religion, national religion. And uh, the Catholic tradition is, uh, Lithuanian tradition uh, is uh, very, 
uh, interesting in, in, in Grodno area. There was a struggle for Catholic Church during Polish times. There was a struggle for uh, Catholic Lithuanian Church during, during Soviet times. Nowadays we have several churches where the service is in Lithuanian language. One of them is uh, St. Linus Church in Pelesa. Uh, well, I spoke about that language. And uh, Lithuanian Catholic Church in Gervati, Gervati, uh, Gervati uh, village. Very beautiful church which was built uh, at the end of the 19th century. Well, to some extent we can agree with this idea that uh, uh, the national tradition is supported by, by religion. Uh, but nevertheless, so uh, there is a difference of understanding of its identity by different kinds of Lithuanians in Grodno region. So uh, they identify themselves with our people, how they say, 71%, with the people of our language, it's very important, 71%, with the people of the same culture, what's culture is sometimes different, difficult to understand, well, 40, 47%, with the territory, a very important aspect because the local identity of the Lithuanians is very characteristic. They identify themselves with the Lithuanian nation, but first of all, they identify with the, with the local uh, village, with the local territory, with the local culture, uh, so 41%. With the historical heritage, 40%. And with the people of the same faith, only 37%. Of course, it's, uh, these figures are not final. It's a sociological um, investigation. Well, it's a case study, and of course, um, these figures, uh, there might be uh, some kind of mistake in these figures and they can change. Well, the identity is changing and the figures uh, describing or, uh, through, or the figures through which we can interpret uh, the identification pro 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 process among Lith Lithuanians, of course, can change as well. Um, the values of the Lithuania. So we presented 200 values, the vital values, peace in the world, the, uh, the values connected with money, for example, with job and so on and so on. So among these values, to be Lithuanian is very important for 72% of the Lithuanians of Grodno region. To speak Lithuanian language or to belong to Lithuanian speaking community, almost 70%. And to be Catholic, 40%. And the rating number is also uh, uh, very uh, topical here. And one more, the orientations of the Lithuanian towards cross-cultural contacts. We are the Lithuanians, they are the Belarusians, the Russians, the Jews, the Poles, and so on and so on. Are we going to make marry, are we going to make friends, are we going to live together, uh, uh, can we work together, and so on. So, Lithuanians uh, prefer to marry Lithuanians. Uh, Lithuanians, there is no difference between Lithuanians uh, for, uh, no, 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 in another way. Uh, so for the Lithuanians, uh, Lithuanians don't make uh, difference between themselves and the Belarusians. Uh, what concerns friendships? Friendship relations. The same about um, neighboring relations, to live together. And common work. Well, almost the same. But it's very interesting that the Lithuanians make differ difference between the Belarusians and Russians. Sometimes we don't make such, such, such difference taking into account uh, cultural aspects. You see, of course the, Belarus, uh, uh, the Lithuanians are, are eager to, to make friends with the Belarusians, but uh, uh, as twice as slower the figure is concerning the Russians. The Poles as well, so they won't like to, to marry the Poles, to make friends with the Poles, and even to, to have common work with the Poles. <laughs> well, well, of course, it's, it's an episode of the research process, and it's impossible to, to interpret uh, these figures as uh, something final. It's necessary to continue to, to monitor this, this situation, but so they, oh, they show some interesting tendencies in the present day Lithuanian culture. So uh, my time is over, it's 3.30, that's why I won't speak about the Poles and the Russians, maybe next time. So and where is, uh, just a moment, I'm sorry. Oh the last words of my, <laughs> of my presentation. Thank you very much. Please pay attention to the Belarusian words. Almost all the same. Thank you so much. Maybe you have questions in any language. You're welcome.
to kvieną klausimą, gal iš pradžių tokia mažą istorijėlę, prieš maždaug aštuonis metus mes važiavom pro Velesą, kaip tik mažą kartu. Ir pasiklydant ir neradom kelio, ir jie šalia tokia mūtaiškė. Mes sako, davai, kad man jau jūs paklausų, bet pabaldo paklausų jie turiškai. Mes jie užkalbinam, jie jau žalėjo tokio matį, bet aš taip suprantu, jie galbūt jūs suprato, ką mes sako. Bet jie jau man sakė tokia keista kalba, jie ten vykai buvo lietuvių kalba, bet tai buvo tarmė, kurie mūtą buvo, nu, paskui jie Čia lingvistikas, lingvistikas, lingvistiškas klausimas, aišku. Nu, aš nesu lingvistas, aš negaliu pasakyti, koks skirtumas tarp, sakysim, lietuvių kalba lietuvoje ir lietuvių kalba, dialektinė lietuvių kalba. Va visi sako, aš kuras skaičiau, čia dialektas, čia labai savotiškas dialektas, lietuvių kalbos dialektas ir Varanovas ryties čia pelėsoja ir gerviečių, gerviečių dialektą. Tai vadinasi, gerviečių lietuvių dialektas ir dialektologai važiuoja ne į pelėsą, bet į šitą, į gerviečių, į gerviečių rajoną, čia studijuoti šitą kalbą. Ir tą sakykit, koks dabar yra santykis tarp rusienų po šito terminu ir baltarusų? Kada šitie terminai jau susijungėt? Yra kada jau rusienai pradedami vadinti baltarusiais? Ar tai yra ta patų? Ar tai yra šiek tiek kas kita? Jūs kalbat apie šitą vardą. Būt būtent rusienas. Rusienas. Ne, rusienas. Rusienas, aš nežinau, rusienas. Rusinai. Rusinai. Čia grupės Ukrainėje čia gyvena. Rusinai. Pas mus tikrai nežinau. Nežinau. Todėl, kad prieš du tūkstančius metus mes ne baltarusai, bet Ir ne Lietuviai, bet Lietuvaičiai, o kažkas. Čia priklauso nuo šalies vardą. Nuo šalies vardą. Baltarusai, tai sredina 19 veikų. Tai va, kodėl aš jūsų klausiu, nes pavyzdžiui 17 amžiai terminas rusienai labai buvo paplitęs. Ir va šito krašto gyventojų sudėtis, kai yra bažnišės visitacijos, tai nei aišku yra daugiau pagal religiją pateikiama. Bet labai yra įdomus dalykas, kad jeigu ten iš karto tas visitatorius gyventojus į dvi grupės sugrupuoja, vieni yra kilmingieji, kiti yra kiti žmonės, nu tie žodžiu paprastai prastiečiai. Ir tada jisai kilmingų religiją kokį sako, kad jie yra tokiai likai, arba šizmatikai, kai yra pravoslavų, Ar kad ar gali būti eretikai, tai yra jau ten religijai, bet kai jisai kalba apie tuos paprastus žmonės, jisai kartai sako, kad yra tokių šizmatikų. Bet jie yra rutienų arba rusienų religijos, tai yra unitai, jisai tapatina rusienų su unitais. Negaliu atsakyti, čia labai įdomus klausimas, ačiū labai, bet dabar ne, reikia pagalvoti ar studijuoti istorikaliai, istorikaliai. Aš reikia, bet man toks vizas sutarė, kad vienkiausi norite nam, jeigu mes gavim skaip, kad iš rusienų galiu baltarusiai, kad būtent jie labai su unitais buvo susiję. Ir kad taip pat labai atrodo, žmonės kurie prekalbėjo, kad būtent, kad senka, taip būtent nama kalba. Čia dabar jūs irgi vieną dabar surodėte labai įdomų grafiką, kad lietuviai bendrauja su baltarusais ir lietuviausia, bet mažai bendrauja su lenkais ir rusiais kitais. Tai va būtent, jeigu žiūrėti į 17 amžių, tai galima pamatyti labai panašią tendenciją, nes tarp tų rusienų gyveno dar trukučiuką pagojonių lietuvių jokvinkų pirmės. Ir kada, kad tai likai verti juos patakti jau krikščionėmis, apsikrikšti, tai jie pasirenka ne katalikų tikėjimą, bet jie pavirsta rusienų tikėjimo žmonėm. Jau yra, jau strašno, kad mes žodžiasim rusienų. Tai yra, ta pati tendencija žodžio yra ir šiandien. Ja paruskai šia skažu, tolko vat į viešką, kuriuo, nu, na, vieną vaš suprūkai tas znaėt karašo, lūkšia minę. Vot, nu, jis buvo šitą kai gipotizą, da, pamojau, Greenblant, vat, razniai buvo šiai pisali aftarai. Aba, vat, štai, vat, bilarusai katolikai, vat, bilarusai savrimenai, bilarusai katolikai, v značitinai stepeni, vat, asimiliravanai, vat, litovci rusifisirovaną, ir to, što nazvati proces rutanizacijai. Vat, ir taki potiza, istisno, jį nada apsuždati ir smatryti, naskolika, naskolika nas pravedljiva. Patamo, što vat u Grinblata, jį, tapusim, jis, kad on provadil isledovanje išio, vat, v 50-ai, v 60-ai godi, da, vat, on zastal tam direvni, znači, vse gavrėt po belaruski. Belarusi katoliki, nazivajot sebe belarusi, no, vat, gavrėt, dėdai išio po litovski gavarili. Ta, dėdai pradėtai, to jis mi išio zastali vrėme, vat kada gavarili, gavarili v semje, v semje palitovskiai. Nu, tai nemaško drugoje, da, ja panimaju, a vat što... Da, vat, a vat što kasajas rusienai, da, vat, k sažalėniu, ja šias nemagu atveit na etat vaprus.
Это вообще у нас вот проблема с названиями, с именами, с, антроп... с, с этнонимией или локальными названиями, или конфессиональными названиями. Это настолько пестрая вещь. Вот, что, ну, вот, допустим, в каждой деревне даже бывает так, соседнюю деревню называют, называют другим словом, другим, другим именем. Они другие по вере, они другие по происхождению, они там еще кто-то. То есть, ну, как бы не накладывается, наверное, нигде так не бывает. Вот как бы современный этноним белорус, он жестко не накладывается. Это скорее политоним, да. Вот. И сегодня вот этот процесс идет, так сказать, политонимия. Мы белорусы, а вместе с тем мы и такие, и другие, и третьи. Исторически это, за, за, за ним очень много стоит, ну, как бы разных вещей. Вот это интересный вопрос, спасибо. А чего бы еще так лаусина? Вот спрошу, а не виса до лянговой летучки от Сакиты. Ага, ты, да. Ну, Арвим Сидома было? А что, Лобай? Вам интересно было? Так сказать. Все, спасибо. Ну, это очень смешно, что литвины не хотят с поляками совершать. Ну, это, опять же, понимаете, это... Я не хочу делать глобальные выводы здесь. Только так началось первое да, да. Это не я, я далек от каких-то категорических выводов, кто там с кем что хочет. Вот. Но во всяком случае, когда белорусы оказываются самыми близкими к литовцам. По духу, по культуре, по ментальности, по образу жизни, по, по, по восприятию мира, по трудолюбию, наверное, то есть по ценностям. Да. Да, 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 да. Вот с белорусами с ассимиляцией происходит культурная ассимиляция, но численность и процент увеличивается. Вот это парадокс. Вообще белорусский народ это ужасно парадоксальный народ. Как и любой, наверное. Но вот у нас вот такие парадоксы. Тейп, тейп, тейп. Пока учита карта, лянку, 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 карта, карта, лянку, карта. Дал, дал лянку и швачаву, и швачаву. Бед не виси айшку, не виси, не виси. Бед аж динаул лянку жмонеску кокс, аж и сулянкас. Те вас лянкас, моти на лянке, всякие сема, аж и су католикас. Бед аж аж не могу лянкишка и тальбети. Кокс аж и аргалима будет лянкас, не калбан для Лянкишка. Вот такое и есть, да. Да, там был такой польский район. Вот, э, я проясню немножко. Такая вот Эльжбета Смолкова, которую я имею честь знать, профессор, может, по-русски сейчас скажу, Варшавского университета, она была когда-то послом в Польше в Республике Беларусь. Но когда пришел наш президент к власти, она почему-то перестала быть послом. Там что-то вот там не то пошло. Вот, она занялась исследовательской работой. У нее несколько книг есть и огромное количество статей. Она доктор, профессор. Вот, она уже не молодая, где-то лет 80 сейчас идет. И вот она, значит, поставила перед собой задачу выяснить, что скрывается за словом «поляк» в Беларуси. А скрываются разные вещи. То есть вот как бы нельзя воспринимать идентичность, вон, вон, вот, вот как, как, какая-то самотождественность. Вот. И она, значит, установила четыре. Ну, я вот об этом уже не говорил, там вот следующий там, у меня фрагмент будет. Первый – поляк, говорящий по-польски. Ведь же для поляков язык – это очень важная вещь. Другое дело, что в результате ассимиляционных процессов и русификации, и деполонизации вот после военного времени, язык исчез, но он не исчез полностью. По-польски говорят в костеле. В костел пришли, все, исповедь по-польски, там правда? Да. Вот вышли из костела, все, заговорили на другом языке. Раз. Второе. По-польски, значит, функционируют у нас различные институты польские. А их очень много сейчас. В каждой школе есть преподаватель польского языка, и не один. Уроки польского языка, там, допустим, матч польска школьная у нас в Гродно функционирует такая вот структура, там филиалы тоже везде и всюду. Библиотека польская. Простите, вы зашли туда в языку польский, вы ложь в языку польский, вы в жадном языку, не, 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 не мурище там, там. Вот. Я со студентами там был, выступал. Там интересно вообще. Вот я им показывал, вот как функционирует, вот, скажем, эта структура. Вот два, да, это союз поляков. Третье. Опять же, старые люди собираются. Вот они будут петь песни. Они не будут петь советские песни. Они будут петь польские песни. И они вот воспроизводят как бы польский языковой фольклор, в песенный фольклор. По-польски это будет особый польский язык. Это будет, будет так званый польшизна красова там и так далее. Вот. Ну и там еще, вот некоторые сферы. То есть язык функционирует. Есть деревни, где люди еще говорят по-польски у нас. 
Но это уже как бы умирающая часть. Да, вообще вот, поляки билингвы, трилингвы, там, и ассимилированные и так далее. Так вот, посмолковый, значит, поляк это говорящий по-польски. Значит, можно, кто-то считает, что можно, можно не говорить, а кто-то считает, нет, надо говорить. Вот, и вот по данным моих исследований, скажем, подавляющее большинство гродненских поляков считают, что язык надо знать. Там говорить не говорить, но язык надо знать польский. Ну, надо, как императив. Раз. Второй католицизм. Ведь же у нас, как считается, ну, на уровне повседневного сознания, поляк, значит, ты католик, я иду в костел, там, а ты, ты, ты что, в костел идешь, ты поляк, да? Ну все, вот нормально. Француз приезжает, значит, ему говорят, а у нас польская Пасха, а он никак понять не может, а у нас нет французской Пасхи, а у нас есть польская Пасха, а у нас есть русская Пасха. То есть этническая и конфессиональная, они оказываются ну, взаимосвязанными, и поляк уже не нация, а поляк уже религия. Русский – это не народ, это религия, это, значит, православный. То есть вот здесь такое смещение происходит, поляк-католик. Хотя не все поляки-католики, есть поляки, атеисты, есть поляки. 3% поляков у нас православные, например, там все что угодно есть, да? Вот, но стереотип такой вот существует. Третий поляк – это тот, кто осознает свою шляхетскость, осознает свое специфическое происхождение, то есть у которого есть какая-то генетическая память. То есть шляхта – это группа социальная, которая никогда не была в крепостной зависимости, которая сама имела там крестьян там, и так далее. То есть это, в общем, ну, определенная там, группа феодалов, так вот будем говорить. Там они были там богатые, небогатые, разные в, раз, в разное время. Вот, в отличие от белорусов, которые были в крепостной зависимости. Но, но это как-то сохранилось на уровне генетической памяти. Не у всех, конечно. Но я э, встречаю, скажем, знакомую, она бьет себя в грудь и говорит, я шляхта. Я говорю, что такое шляхта? Я говорю, не знаю. Я шляхта. Вот понимаете, это вот сидит где-то здесь. Четвертое. По Смолковой. Поляк – это тот, кто осознает свою принадлежность к единой польской нации, если такая существует. Хотя, скажем, в Беларуси существует две концепции. Одна концепция – это поляки, это ассимилированные белорусы, полонизированные вот в XVI веке в процессе контрреформации. И эта точка зрения существует. Она, ну, она не столько официальна, но, там, скажем, в 60-е годы она была практичной. Какой ты поляк? Ты католичный белорус. Говоришь по-белорусски, исповедуешь католицизм. А раз католик, значит поляк – это неправильно. Вот. Вторая точка зрения, вторая концепция. Все-таки были разные волны переселения поляков на территорию Беларуси. Из Мазови, из Мазовши там, и так далее. Вплоть до 20 века, когда очень много осадников приехало. Там, до 100 тысяч человек, скажем, на территории Западной Беларуси. Так вот те, кто осознает себя все-таки частью белорусского народа, Поляк, но часть белорусского народа, так называемый белорусский поляк, да? или поляк Беларуси, тот, кто осознает себя частью большой польской нации, которая существует в мировом пространстве, и вот как бы... Э вот у нас есть поляки, которые об этом думают, есть поляки, которые не думают. Вот, вот по, -по, -по Смулковой, значит, вот четыре основания польской идентичности. Смулкова считает, да, можно быть поляком и не говорить по-польски. Да, но это вот есть какие-то другие основания. Генетические, примордиалистские там, и так далее, вот для самой идентификации. Но... Ира, 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 Болтарусу, Болтарусу шляхта. То шляхта, что не, 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 категория, а это социальная категория. Это дал полянку головой, как, ну, будь и шляхта, будь и лянкас. Это сейчас социальная категория, а что, как, и ж Болтарус Ирки был, лабай дал и шляхту. Вот не виси, ты я садил вот такая шесть шляхта. Да ты рад, вот я же молился. Ага. Тейп. Угу.